then I went into the classroom and uh, used the computer in the classroom and it wouldn't let me lower the cycle to less than three days in Astromancer. Hmm. But I would go back into my office and I would use it there on my laptop and it would allow me to do that. Yes. And so I logged out, restarted the computer in the classroom, went back and it would do the same thing. It wouldn't, uh, I would put in like uh, point one to uh, try to get it to um, show the the uh, cycle, the phases, and it would kick it back to three automatically okay. when I tried to do the matching. Sounds faintly familiar. Let me see if I can brainstorm this. Now, this was the new version of it. Uh-huh. Okay. So, so I would go through the light curve. I'd go into the period there. And then, uh, and then it would give me like 0. 0.3. And then I would go over to the period folding. And there, it wouldn't let me go underneath three for the lowest setting. It was, it was always three to 100 is what it would give me. And when I put in 0. 0.33, it would kind of show the graph and then it would kick me back to three as the minimum. I wonder if... These somehow got edited. I'm trying to remember if the ranges here might impact the ranges over here. Let's see. No. But see, it worked fine on my laptop in the in the in my office. It just it just would not do it on the one lab the the uh, presentation computer in the classroom. So, yeah, I wonder if you should check the settings on these here. I don't know. I think um, on the upper side, I don't think it matters. Okay, so the range is set point one to. Nine. So I guess the range is independent of what is here. Even yeah, I, and I could put in point three there. Do one to a hundred here, and then come over here. Yeah. See, and it allows it. Yeah, it allows that the range up to the length of the data set down to point 0.1. It's yeah. not tied. I think in the old interface, they were tied. So I was hoping maybe that could explain it. Maybe you couldn't, if one of these was set to three, maybe you couldn't go above three on the other page, but that doesn't seem to explain it. If you can shoot a video okay, uh, uh, on that particular laptop and I'll see what we can catch. Yeah. Yeah, I just I restarted the uh, computer and everything, and uh, and and um, I tried it also the second day, and it did the same thing. Hmm. So I thought it was, but but I kept going back to my office, and I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And it even if you in the office. reload the page or do a shift reload, yeah, I mean, I I restarted the whole computer. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, hmm. run it and um, shoot a video, and we'll okay. figure it out. Um, maybe. Do you know what um, browser you are using? Is um, it on the typically, two? I use Firefox. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe that's a hint as well. But we'll we'll take your video and we'll try to replicate. Send also send the data file. Um, okay. Even though it worked fine on the one computer, we'll try to replicate it. We're using different browsers on the two computers. Uh, no, I was using okay. Firefox on both of them. I don't know then. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that one. Um, but I mean, this is how we debug, right? We have hundreds of students doing this. We haven't gotten a complaint. Uh, yeah. And, and, but then there's some edge case that we didn't account for and, and you stumbled on it. And so now we don't want to dismiss it. We want to figure it out so we can eliminate it. And we just keep okay. the edge cases until it becomes more and more robust for all sorts of platforms, browsers, scenarios. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So send a video. All right. So I recall you always start these meetings with some bad news. <laughs>
I think last time you had some bug I couldn't figure out as well, but. Um, oh, well, is that, it was just maybe changing the options on the uh, assignment for how giving student feedback. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, today, today's lab is a little bit short, so I threw some extra stuff in here. Uh, first, I just want to let, uh, let you know about the, the uh, year three report to DOD. Uh, we got this, am I recording? I think I am. Yeah, uh, we got this finished up yesterday. So DOD, the reporting requirements are insane. Uh, we have to do a report every quarter. With NSF, it's every year. With DOD, it's every quarter. And it kind of ramps up. And I, you start the year off purposefully trying to make it a short report because it keeps accumulating. By the time you get to the end of the year, it turned into a 40-page report. And uh, but it's a good summary of what's going on now. And, you know, I'm not going to go through it all, but the, the things that you could find in here, if you're interested, um, a report on uh, work that was done this year on the MWU curriculum. I know you're all here for Opus, but maybe you have some interest in MWU and you can see the stuff we've been working on this year, kind of the testing of the labs and development of some final radio activities. Uh, this is the the last MWU unit is kind of in the middle of the sequence uh, where they're beginning to do radio in a more serious way. And we start with them just doing a bunch. Each of these little blocks is 20 square degrees of the sky. We just have them start the whole class maps out the plane, of the galaxy, and it's a discovery process. And anyway, uh, so curricular stuff. I'm going to demo one of the MWU curricular items uh, today. Uh, if you're at our meeting over the summer, you, you saw it already, but uh, I'm going to show you this tool here. Since we have a little bit of extra time, I figured I'd give you a little taste of MWU. Uh, what else is in this report? A lot about the Skynet 2 effort on the software front. So I've been mentioning for a while that Skynet 2 is coming. Um, hopefully, you know, I, ideally, we deploy it at the beginning of summer, but you know, no promises that we'll hit that target, but we're trying. And it's just going to be a game changer in terms of observing systems. We're hoping some of the other networks will just not switch over to Skynet, but use Skynet as their scheduling engine. But we'll see how that goes. So there's a lot on the, if you want to know what goes into a major software development, uh, there's good stuff to read here. A lot of it was written by undergrads too, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, uh, hardware updates. So we're in the final, actually beyond the final, this is the no cost extension year. And the primary thing is finishing Skynet 2 and getting um, the radio telescopes online. So we have radio telescope. We, we of course have one online. In fact, I'll show you how to schedule some observations on it today for lab seven. Uh, but we're integrating more of them, uh, these two in Tasmania, and this one right here is a 14 meter. One in the background is a 26 meter. The 14 meter, we're going to get 50% of the time on, which is huge, a huge amount of time uh, with the 10 year access. And there's another one in uh, North Carolina that we're gearing up as well. So uh, some bits about the hardware efforts, some bits about evaluation. This is actually using the Opus data. And so all these surveys you're doing, if you want to see what's happening, uh, these are the most recent publications. This one in particular has um, the self-efficacy result about how we're getting huge gains in self-efficacy with Opus and removing um, kind of the, um, the gender uh, effect uh, where women initially score lower, but... Uh, by the end of doing opus, they have the same self-efficacy as the as the men in the class. So some stuff on the evaluation, external evaluation. Of course, I don't expect you to read all this, but I'm just letting you know this resource is here. Yeah. And then just random stuff at the end, but it's a good document. So if you're interested in all that's going on. Okay. And I emailed that to, I think everyone uh, got that yesterday. Now, let's see. I was going to, since Lab 6 is short, I figured I'd start by demoing one of the MW activities. This is one that we're kind of proud of. 
though it was actually down. We just rebooted up the server. So my fingers are crossed that it actually works well. Let me actually start an afterglow. This is our HR diagram um, activity. So the MWU activities are more advanced. The Opus activities are kind of introductory. They're a little bit more follow the steps, cookbooky, where the MWU activities, um, you know, have a lot of variation in terms of what data students can choose to collect. Like this group, they work in groups of four, they pull their time, and this group may do this target, this group may do that target, they pick their targets. So it's kind of a level up in terms of teaching it. Uh, you got to know your stuff because with fresh data sets, there's going to be this problem with this one and this problem with that one. You got to be kind of on your toes a little bit. Uh, so it's a, a little bit more demanding of the instructor. But uh, we also do cooler things. Uh, Opus is based around the cosmic distance ladder. Uh, this curriculum is very much orthogonal to it. There's solar system stuff. There's stars uh, formation and evolution stuff. I'm going to show you stellar evolution, just a little taste of it. And there's galaxy stuff, uh, both evolution and, and structure and mass and whatnot. And... Um, the students work, as I said, in teams. They pull their time. We give the students, instead of 30 minutes in Opus, we give them two hours. And then working in a team of four, they have eight hours. So there's a lot of stuff they can do. And they can, um, and the curriculum is both optical and radio. There's a little bit of radio in Opus, but this is 50% radio. And in some of the units, we um, bring in some archival infrared from NASA sites and, and do some pretty cool stuff. But anyway, uh, let me just demo. I think some of you've seen this before if you're at the conference. Uh, I'm going to load in some images that we've made. And the students learn how to... These are actually not individual images. These are They took many images and stacked them and cleaned them. And so these are very nice images of the open cluster 2437. I'm getting them loaded in right now. Okay, and I'll just quickly do a, well, let's do an alignment first. Go to the aligner, select all of them. I'm not expecting you to learn this. I'm just kind of demoing it. If it's something that you'd be interested in, then, you know, you can build it in your classes. And there's a version of this where you don't even need Skynet. You can just pull stuff out of archives. But let's see, I'm aligning these. Shouldn't take long. It's done. I'm going to group them into a multi-layer FITS file. And they're going to load in here. Uh, the, blue, the B one, I'm going to color blue. The I one, I'll turn off. And we'll use it for the photometry. Uh, the red one, I'll color red. The green one, I'll color green. And when I aligned them, they had to reload. So we'll see how these are coming in. Coming in slowly. For whatever reason, my internet's not as good as it. Strange. Normally they pop right in. I know, um, my wife's doing a video con downstairs and oh, there's a little bit of red <laughs> and I am doing a zoom meeting up here and I'm not at work. I'm at home. So maybe that's slowing me down, but I just did this a moment ago. Anyway, they're loading in. We'll get to the color bit in a bit. Uh, let's just move on to the photometry while it's thinking about loading these images in. So I'll go to source catalog and I'm going to, Extract sources from the entire, I'll use the red image, because you tend to have the most sources in there. And this shouldn't take long because it's hitting the server, which does not depend upon my internet connection. We're saying that. Maybe the issue isn't my internet connection. Maybe something's up with Afterglow, even though I was just using it. Cancel that for a second. 
Maybe it just won't do it till it's done loading these. Ridiculously slow. And reload the page here. Yeah, that was better. Bring the blue one in. Okay, let's bring the red one in. Green one. Combo, okay, I'll come up here and um, let me just link them percentile real quick. Just the um, scaling to midtone to make it a little bit prettier. Not that that matters for this exercise. Okay, I, I don't, my browser was hung up or something. So that wasn't that bad once I refreshed. So this is an open cluster. You can see all sorts of stars here, uh, blue stars. So but also some red stars. This is actually intermediate age. So the, the hottest bluest stars are gone and some red giants are starting to form. Okay, so let's do the HR diagram of this. I'll go to one of them here. I'll go to the source catalog and I'm going to extract all the sources across the entire image. It's normally a 10 or 20 second operation. So fingers crossed. There we go. Good, good. Okay. And now that I found them, I'm going to go to the photometry tab. Try to. Okay, I'm here. And it's calculating zero points and doing photometry, but I'm just going to do all of them um, on the server, even though it's up, trying to update the screen right now. It's running this job. It's going to photometer each of these sources in all four images. And then give me a file. Okay, it's running the job. And that's a lot of stars. It's about 6,000 stars. So this will probably take 30 or 40 seconds. I'll let it run because uh, I actually have the file because I just did this before the meeting. So we'll come back and check, but we can move on to the next step. So here we're over in Astromancer, and it's not one of the tabs shown here. These are just Opus at the moment. If you come over here, there's the cluster tab. And this hasn't been used for a while. We just rebooted the server, so hopefully everything's going to be fine. Okay, I'm loading in. Oh, that wasn't good. Try it again. Yeah, I'll reload this one too. Well, This is making me very sad. So I just ran through the whole analysis before the meeting. There, okay. NGC 2437. Fingers crossed that this takes. Could be my programmer's been messing with it. Oh, good. It took? Okay. So what we did there... Let's see if it's done over here. Yeah, so it's done doing the photometry. It's loading the results. It's going to have a little file here we can download. What I've done is I've uploaded it here. And upon upload, it took all the stellar positions and cross-correlated it with Gaia. So now for the stars that we just photometered in Afterglow, we have proper motions and distances. Okay, and so here they are. And 
this is a uh, proper motion space. This isn't, isn't on the sky space. This is proper motion space in RA versus DEC. And these are 1D histograms. And so the cluster, you know, there are a lot of field stars. Most of the stars in the image are not tied to the cluster, but all the cluster stars were formed together will be moving together. And in this particular example, it's pretty easy to see where they are. And so we're gonna try to get rid of the field stars and this will improve the HR diagram. Down here, it's getting cleaned up as we isolate it in proper motion space. Now, where I uploaded my file, you didn't have to do that. Back on the data page, you could uh, pull up a cluster right from the archive using Gaia, APAS, whatever. Um, so that's a way in which this tool can be used even in lecture classes without Skynet access, which was one of the goals. So I've isolated the cluster there. Maybe I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see it better. Shrink that ellipse a little bit. Okay. And you can also isolate it in distance because we've cross correlated with Gaia. So here's the distance distribution for this thing. Something like that. So we've got rid of about three quarters of the stars. Here's our HR diagram. Now we could go and proceed straight to isochrone matching. You can also add catalog stars. If I want to also look at Gaia, A pass, two mass Ys, I can grab that stuff now, particularly now that I've isolated in proper motion space. That means the query, you know, there are far fewer stars that have that position in the sky and that proper motion. And uh, that narrows it down to a number of stars the browser can take in. But I'll just do this with the stars that I have from the Skynet data. So we're going to plot some HR diagrams. Let's do a B minus R versus V. And let's add a V minus I versus R, just a slightly redder one. So we have a couple to compare to. OK. The distance. <laughs> Should be around 1.6 something based on the histogram here. It recommends 1.64, which was the median of that histogram. Now, uh, so what, you know, these are color magnitude diagrams. So color down here and absolute magnitude here. Now I'm going to increase the age of this because all that upper main sequence has evolved off. All those stars are now dead. Age, metallicity, uh, this is an open cluster, so it should be closer to solar metallicity. And what I'm really trying to do is match the shape. You see a little bit of wiggle there, so I got a little bit of wiggle here. Dust, so if I correct the dust, that moves, everything gets brighter and bluer if I correct for dust. Maybe I need to drop the age down a little bit. Bring the metallicity up. Down here where it's noisy, the stars will be on either side of the line, but where it's cleaner, the stars should ride above because binaries are artificially a little bit bright. Thanks. And I'm adjusting the age to run through these red giants over here. If you want to get rid of some of the noise, you, you can here as well. But anyway, it's basically how it works. And so from your own data, you can measure ages and metallicities. If you want, you can even come back here to Afterglow and correct for extinction along the line of sight, which if there was a lot of dust, this would be artificially red. But using the tools over here, you can correct and uh, return it to its intrinsic color, even when it's measured. Anyway. So I, I know some of you saw that uh, before uh, at the conference, but it's probably new to some of you. And I just want to give you a hint of some of the more advanced things that you can do with students uh, in like a follow-up course. Questions, comments? Typical demo where things work very poorly, but we got through it, so. Okay.
Let's move on to what we're here for, which is lab six. It's on our YouTube list. It's up to date through lab five. We'll add this one today. Uh, here are the lab six opus videos from the Skynet um, intro astro page. And again, you know, it's the standard intro background procedure and the how-to videos. The first one is about, uh, it includes some instructions on how to use spreadsheets and how to code equations into spreadsheets, which is a good skill, you know, at this level. And not just being able to calculate things on a calculator, but what if you have 30 objects like we will in this one? Uh, that can be really tiresome, but with a little bit of uh, spreadsheet know-how, you can do things a lot easier. Okay, so let's go to lab six. So again, the standard links, um, reminder to put in the observations. The observations are for lab seven. So let's hop over to lab seven for just a moment. We'll come back and do the rest of lab six, which goes pretty quick, as I said before. Lab seven is a different beast uh, compared to the other labs. It's different in a number of ways. Uh, this is our spectroscopy lab. And in an introductory sequence, often the spectroscopy lab is you have some emission lamps, maybe hydrogen, and you have uh, some kind of disperser, and they look through it, they see the lines. If you have a good setup, they can make measurements. And that's, you know, something like that is pretty standard in introductory labs. In astronomy, you should have some spectroscopy, but it's hard you know, to do something uh, interesting. And I, I wouldn't call looking at emission lamps super interesting. So this one, I hopefully you'll agree, and we'll go through it in great detail next time, is more interesting. They're going to measure the rotation curve of the Milky Way using radio spectra. Uh, it turns out, uh, you know, optical telescopes can acquire spectra. We don't have any spectrographs on Skynet yet. Under Skynet 2, you will be able to put them on, but they're complicated instruments and complicated analysis. But spectroscopy in the radio is actually super easy. In fact, you can't not do it. Whenever you take a radio observation, you get a spectrum for free. And down at the wavelengths that we use, L-band, 1.4 gigahertz, there is the famous hydrogen emission line. Uh, cold hydrogen, cold neutral hydrogen, electron in the ground state, uh, as we'll talk about next time, you can have the spin-flip transition where the electron flips from this higher state to this lower state, all in the ground state, but it's a very subtle energy transition. And the universe is full of cold hydrogen. Uh, so it, in particularly the, the galaxy, which we're in, makes a whopping signature here. So it's easy. You can see it in a tenth of a second observation. In fact, we've lengthened the exposures, I, I think, to 10 seconds now, though some of the videos still say two seconds. Uh, just because the system's not good at making an observation that's too short uh, in duration, gets hung up sometimes. So we're observing longer than we even need to. It just, this is super easy to detect. And so in this lab, uh, they'll be measuring Doppler shifts of it due to the motion of the galaxy. Uh, we're going to observe the spectra, uh, spectrum of the Milky Way at 12 points from the galactic center on out to about almost the 90 degree point. And uh, they'll be measuring Doppler shifts. So they're, in this lab, they're learning spectroscopy, they're learning Doppler shift. Doppler shift's important because we have some cosmology labs coming up where they'll be doing cosmological redshift, which is actually different from Doppler redshift. Uh, although they're often presented the same, they say this galaxy is moving away from us at this speed. It's actually not. Space is expanding, carrying it away. And so for them to understand that distinction, they really need to understand Doppler shift first so they can have something to distinguish it against. So, uh, hey, Dan? yeah, please. Got a quick, quick, actually two quick questions. Yeah. Um, one, can you, because this is a topic I'm, I'm particularly interested in, spectroscopy. Can you very briefly, I know it's complicated, but maybe distinguish between spectroscopy versus photometry versus um, uh, astrometry? Yep. And what tools do you recommend for them typically? Yep. So photometry is the process of measuring the brightness of something. And we just did a demo of that where we measured the brightness of every star in this field in four filters. 
And, and so Afterglow is a great tool for students to do that. Um, it doesn't have to be as complicated as I demonstrated. Well, as you know, as you know, because we learned how to do photometry in lab five, uh, where they just clicked on one star and a reference star. You don't have to click on every single star in the image or select every star in the image and then put down apertures. But let me clear this out for a second. I'll come back here and I'll just... It's slow with that many stars marked in the browser. Oops. Delete all. That should speed my browser up, hopefully. Doesn't help that I have 40 tabs up in each of these windows as well. <laughs> Come on. Only 40? You're doing better than me. <laughs> oh, goodness, this is painful. Oh, well, maybe I have to. I'm just going to refresh. And I haven't rebooted my laptop in like a month either. Exit page, give up. Here, tell you what, <laughs> I have an image in the DOD report. Here we go. This is in the radio, but you get the idea. This is what I wanted to demonstrate. So whether it's optical or radio, photometry is the process of measuring the brightness of something. So you can zoom into a star, click on it. It puts down an aperture, it puts down an annulus. You measure, you count everything up in the aperture, figure out the average value in the annulus, subtract that from each pixel in the aperture. Okay, aperture photometry. Okay, so that's photometry. And, and you know, you also get stars in the image of known magnitude, so you can calibrate. Uh, spectroscopy is the process of taking the light from one of the stars or points. It doesn't necessarily have to be a star and uh, dispersing it. So you have a spectrum and I'll show you some of those in the radio. You've seen spectra in the optical. You can use a prism or a grating. Uh, gratings are typically used. Um, or volume phase holographic grading. Those are very high efficiency. And light goes in and gets dispersed uh, like, like a prism. And then you can measure the brightness of different emission and absorption features across the spectrum. In the radio, uh, you don't have that as your disperser. It's all done electronically, but um, you, you get that spectrum in the electronics and, and you can output it. In fact, you have to in the radio. It comes automatically. So that's spectroscopy. Astrometry is measuring the position. And so, uh, and after, and you, that's very much like when you're doing photometry. You click on the star and it puts down the aperture and annulus in afterglow. As you hover over it, it will centroid and tell you exactly the RA and DAC. So you can click kind of close to it. It will calculate the actual center and get the position. And that's astrometry. And then the other tree is polarimetry. And uh, we're actually uh, working on integrating some polarimeters into Skynet now, where it takes the light and measure it, it measures it um, as it comes through. Well, you get polarimetry in the radio and uh, the optical if you have these special cameras that we're now purchasing, where in the optical, it's like um, in the camera, it's like a bear array. Every two by two pixel has uh, kind of a filter over the front, one oriented like this, one like this, one like this, and one like that. And from what components the light can make it through those different uh, polarized barriers, you can measure polarization. So those that's a summary of the trees. Hopefully that helps. Okay. I'm not gonna try to reload that now. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the other things about Lab 7, so spectroscopy, Doppler shift, uh, of course, introduction of radio, so multi-wavelength, their intuitions in the optical, but now they're going to be using this telescope, which is pretty cool. It's uh, 
six stories tall, 150 tons, 20 meters across the dish, bigger than any optical telescope. And they're getting, it's in, this one's in West Virginia. They're going to be moving it around, acquiring observations. Uh, my only regret is I can't get a webcam on this because webcams make radio noise. And so they're very uh, uncooperative at the observatory. Uh, I almost have them agreeing to giving me one as long as I put it in a Faraday cage and put it a mile away from the telescope with the telephoto lens. Then they'll let me do it. And so as the students move this around, they can see it move around. Um, what else is unique about this lab? There's um, there's a little bit of trigonometry. There's the back. It's a little bit background heavy. We'll talk about this more next next time when we talk about. But the background for this is a little heavy. But the execution is easy, and they get the rotation curve, and they can measure the mass out to any distance. We even throw in the LMC and SMC, uh, which are well out beyond the visible edge, and they can make statements about dark matter. So dark matter is the carrot in this lab. Anyway, what we're doing today is just putting in the observation, showing you how to put in the observations. So I'm going to go to Skynet. I'm going to go to radio observing. I'm going to add a new observation. And um, for these, we're going to switch over to the galactic coordinate system. And they're putting in 12 of them, starting one at 0, 0 which is looking right at the center of the galaxy. I'll give it a name, and I advise the students to put the uh, the longitude in the name because they're going to have to, every one of them is going to have 12 of these, a complete set. Every individual gets their own complete set of data because they're so easy to acquire and schedule. Uh, if they put the longitude in here, they'll be able to quickly distinguish which is which. The elevation map doesn't work in galactic coordinates, and I can't get my programmers to fix it because they're They've already fixed in Skynet 2. They don't want to touch the Skynet 1 code, so uh, fine. But, um, oh, yeah, I, I was going to mention when I was showing the telescope here, Yeah, other cool things about radio is it works during the day, right? And uh, works through clouds and rain. It's only really a lightning storm that can shut us down. So that means the data comes back pretty good. You have 24 hours uh, to work with. Though sometimes the telescope does go down for maintenance, and right now it's our only telescope that will change uh, soon. Anyway, uh, let me put this in, save and continue. Here, it's kind of like picking your filter, uh, but this is the sp spectrum. For this one, if you want to do Doppler shifts, you go into high resolution mode. But you can leave the two frequencies the same. You're going to get two high resolution spectra back to back around these central frequencies. The line will be around this one. Save and continue. And we're just going to track it for 10 seconds. It's a very easy observation to make. You submit it. And then to do the next one, you just click on it again, and the student resubmits it. And they just move, increase this by 8 degrees. We're going to go in increments of 8 degrees along the plane. So we're going to get 12 of these going out to 88. And just save. Save, save, submit, and then they, you know, they get all twelve of them in there. Then when it comes back, it looks something like this. Here, here's the two spectra you get with the line and the one, and um, we'll learn how to analyze these next time. But you see different bumps because you're crossing different arms of the galaxy with different redshifts. The most redshifted one is the one that will let us build up the rotation curve. Anyway, enough of that, but have them put in their observations for Lab 7. Okay. 21 minutes left, and that should be enough for Lab 6, because it is relatively quick. Now, you know, if you're trying to find something to do with the extra time, if you haven't done the RGB picture from Lab 1, this is a, another place that you could squeeze, squeeze it in. Okay, the goals here. This is an application lab. Uh, in Lab 5, they learned how to measure distances using R. Lyries, Cepheids, Type 1As. Here, this is going to be an application of the R. Lyries and the Cepheids. And we'll come back to the Type 1As when we do cosmology. So they're going to use R. Lyries and globular clusters to measure our distance from the center of the Milky Way and show that 
our solar system's not at the center. So this is a continuation of the, uh, the main story of our place in space. Back in lab three, they learned that, uh, you know, we're not at the center of the solar system, the sun is, and here they're gonna learn the sun is not the center of the galaxy, it's off in the outskirts. They'll also use the Aurelaris to measure the size of the Milky Way. And then uh, in the, the last part of the lab, they'll use cepheids in nearby galaxies. Back then they were called spiral nebulae because we didn't realize they were galaxies like our own. And they're gonna measure the distance to them and they're gonna take pictures of them. We put the observations in last time, measure their angular sizes, knowing the distance, figure out their physical sizes. And from that, they're gonna learn that our Milky Way galaxy is not special. Uh, it's the same size as everything else out there. Okay. So this is basically the great debate of 1920. You don't wanna do this lab without lab five. Some people pick and choose labs, but these, you know, this lab requires lab five. Okay, a little bit about the background. I can do this real quick. I made a nice little table here. I'll just bring my notes over in a second, but the great debate in 1920 between Harlow Shapley, Heber Curtis, debating the size and scale of the known universe at the time. And so here's a little table here. These are, these are my notes that I have up, but I always forget to look at when I'm doing these. But um, the three goals that I mentioned, those are the three things they debated. But really, they were debating across each other, you know, talking past each other to some degree. Uh, Shapley was really focused on our place in the Milky Way and its size. Curtis was really focused on uh, the spiral nebulae. Um, and we didn't know if they were galaxies like our own or small things like the globular clusters just kind of in a cloud around us. Anyway, they're both right about one thing, wrong about one thing, and the other is a tie. Shapley said that we're not at the center of the Milky Way. Curtis said we were. Shapley was right. Uh, Curtis said the spiral nebulae were the same size, typical of the Milky Way. Shapley said they weren't. Curtis was right. And on the size of the Milky Way, Shapley overestimated by a factor of three. Curtis underestimated by a factor of three. So they're both off by a factor of three in that one. And so now we're going to do it ourselves. Uh, two more background sections, one on the R. Lyries and how we can use them to probe the Milky Way. So first, a little bit about globular clusters. Globular clusters start as a cloud of gas, maybe about 100,000 solar masses. It dis gets disrupted, disturbed, so it starts to collapse and fragment, and it's unstable on all scales. Clouds of gas are borderline stable anyway. So you just disturb it a little bit, starts to collapse and fragment, fragments, fragment, fragments, fragments, fragment. To, and keeps going until you get um, about 100,000 solar mass blobs. Each becomes a solar system. It gives you a glob. Now, this happens in the plane of the Milky Way, but those star clusters are torn apart by gravitational shear. So you don't have globulars sitting in the plane. But they're up above the plane because they were also formed when the Milky Way formed. So in this figure, these clouds are now much bigger. These are galactic-sized clouds that merge and form our <laughs> early Milky Way galaxy. And as they're doing so, little pockets collapse. Each of these yellow dots is a globular cluster. This whole process here is now each of these yellow dots. And the gas settles down into a plane, but those globs are already out of the plane and they just continue on their uh, randomly oriented orbits in, in the galactic halo. And so what we do in this lab, there are 150 globs, uh, in this lab, we give them a random selection of 30 to not overwhelm them. And um, we give them an R library in each one. And they calculate the distance based upon what they learned before. And then we have a tool that lets them make a top-down projection as if we're outside of the galaxy looking down. And you can see the distribution of the globs. And you'll also see where we are in that distribution. If we're at the center of the Milky Way, we'll be at the center of this globular distance cluster distribution because it's centered on the Milky Way. And also the extent of it gives you kind of the size of the Milky Way. So that's how we're going to measure our place in the Milky Way and its size. Then in the second part, focuses more on Curtis's part of the debate, the spiral nebulae, the most famous of which is Andromeda, but there are a bunch of them out there. Again, back then they didn't know that they were spiral galaxies. 
they call them spiral nebulae. And uh, we've the students we learned last time how to do it. They've already observed five of these, uh, up to five, depending on what's observable this time of year. And they have images, simple one-shot images. They'll measure the angular size. We'll give them a Cepheid in each of these to calculate the distance, a Cepheid and a period. And um, then they'll get the distance, combine that with the angular size, using our favorite geometry that we see over and over to get the physical size. And so in their image, they'll measure the angular size. That as a fraction of 360 degrees is equal to the physical size as a fraction of the circumference of this big circle, which is 2 pi times the distance, which they just calculated. So they can now calculate physical sizes of these, these galaxies and show that they're similar to the Milky Way. OK. So the R. Lyrae exercise. Uh, here's the procedure section on that. This bit I, I dislike, but I can't figure out a way around it. Uh, the, the globs are in the longitude latitude coordinate system. And so we define this here, zero, zero, which is what we just put in, right? Uh, in terms of an observation for the, um, the radio lab, zero, zero points at the center. Longitude is the angle in the plane off to one side and latitude, galactic latitude is the angle up out of the plane. Um, the reason I don't like this is this figure kind of gives away the answer. The sun is obviously not at the center, but if we were at the center, I'm not sure how you would define longitude. So yeah, maybe I'll come up with some work around there, but uh, not ideal, but it's okay. And here, here's the view. From Earth, here's the zero, zero point. Longitude's running from minus 180 to plus 180. Latitude from minus 90 to plus 90. And here are those 30 globular clusters. And let me take it out of answer key mode so we can see it as the students would. OK. Here we go. So the longitude, the latitude, we give them the apparent magnitude. They're going to put in the absolute magnitude, which is a constant for all our Lyries. This is an R Lyrae in the glob. These are the coordinates of the glob. And calculate the distance. And so we teach them a little basic spreadsheet work. We're going to copy this, go over to Excel or whatever spreadsheet they're using, numbers in uh, the Mac system. And we're going to paste. I think you have to paste special. Else those fill in the blank boxes uh, come in here and it gets kind of confusing. Uh, I'm going to wrap that so we can see the headers. And uh, the top-down projection part is done in the application. But here, let's just calculate the distances. All our Lyries have an absolute magnitude, capital M of 0.75. And then to calculate the distance, you may remember 0.01 times 1.585 to the little m minus big M. And the videos go through, you know, how to enter an equation in and drag it down. So they don't have to calculate all of these by hand. But now what we have are the two angular coordinates and the distance. I'm going to move this out of the way here. Come back to the Astromancer environment. And here we'll go to the one called scatter. I'm going to start by grabbing those angles. I'll come in here and overwrite. This is just junk data. OK, and then I'm going to grab those distances. And this is a cool application. It does all the trig for them. You know, we can, we're looking at it from within the plane. But what if we were above the plane looking down upon it? If we give the longitude, latitude, and distance from us, we can calculate the top-down projection. And that does it here for them. And then they model it. You can already see we're not at the center. Here's the distribution. The center is here. And the eye is very good at finding centroids um, of distributions of points. Uh, the yellow dot can actually be a bit of a distractor. I'm going to kind of cover it up so my eyes and distracted by it. But I got something like eight. I think 8.1 is the official value, which seems totally reasonable. And then the size, 
the Milky Way is going to be about the size of the globular cluster distribution, you know, something kind of like that. And so we just measured our distance from the center, uh, which we'll use in the galactic rotation curve lab next, and the size of the Milky Way. You know, nice, simple modeling tool. Okay, so let's go back to the lab and see where this stuff fits in. They present their distance calculation, make their top-down map, they save it and upload it here. What's the distance between us and the center? We've measured about eight kiloparsecs. They Google the true value, calculate percent error. Who is more right about that? Shapley said we were not at the center. And then uh, what's the distance across the... Let's see, there should be a source of error calculation. Oh yeah, right here. Source of error calculation, uh, source of error statement. Uh, the difficulty finding the centroid of 30 points. Uh, for the distance across the distribution, that's the size of the Milky Way. Uh, they record it, Google it, percent error. Significant source of error is trying to find the edge. That's harder, uh, determining the edge. There are only a handful of points out there. So it's a larger source of error. They, they can discuss that. Who's more right about the size of the Milky Way? Neither. I'm going to add some extra text to help them because I've learned that a lot of the students will think of it of it as a difference. 30 is closer to 10 than it is to 100 as a difference. There's a factor. They're both about a factor of three off from what each of these people said. And so neither were actually correct. Both were off by a factor of three. Uh, they're off from each other by a factor of 10, but in astronomy, three times three is 10. So, okay. So that's the, the Milky Way part of the lab. Pretty straightforward to do. And then the Cepheid part, here's where they put in the observation. They observed just five 80-second exposures of these galaxies. Again, we have a table, and uh, there are a small number. They could do it by hand, or they can copy it into a spreadsheet. The, the video explains how to do that. Except here, we're giving them a Cepheid. Uh, so we give it the apparent magnitude and the period. And they use the period equation from last time to calculate the absolute magnitude, and then the apparent and absolute to calculate the distance, as we just did. They can fill those in. Um, sample calculations, both for the absolute magnitude and the distance. And then they're going to load up their image in Afterglow. Wow, I'm just having a terrible afterglow day. It's because of all those damn points. I got to get the thing to delete, but it's normally not that bad. Hey, Dan, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, on the last section where you're looking at the globs, um, do you kind of also mention that when it comes to the random selection of the globular clusters that, you know, it would be there would be a higher density of globular cluster towards the middle. Yeah, the I don't mention it. I probably should. In that sample figure that I showed, you could see the higher density. Um, in this version, you can see it a little bit. Oh, uh, I can either mention it. I can mention it um, earlier in the lab, where back in the background section. You actually have the plot with them all in there, or a schematic of it anyway. And yeah, there is a concentration at the center. Or I can just expand and include all 150. If we're using spreadsheets, when I first wrote this, we weren't using spreadsheets. They had to calculate it by hand. So 150 was too many. But for using spreadsheets, we could just have all of them. And it's no slower. So yeah, good observation. Now, when I get to the update of this, I'll try to do one of those approaches. Okay, let's see, one of those galaxies was M66. I'll just load in my most recent M66 observation. Okay, maybe not that one. Let's go back here again.
Okay. Not necessarily the best, but it's clearly there. And um, we tell the students to actually change the saturation down to 90%, help see the outskirts. This is a poor image, but um, usually the background is blacker than this. But once you do that, can see the outskirts, you grab the measuring tool and just kind of measure from tip to tip. And then you have the angular size, 6.4. Let me just open one more and see if I get a better image. I'll take the earliest one. This is from forever ago. Let's see what it looks like. Now, oh, that looks a lot better. Okay. So I'll lower it down to 90% saturation so I can really see the edges better. And so it's from like here to here, I got 7.3 arc minutes that time. So back to the lab. Okay, they they have the distances to each. So they're going to put in their angular size and arc minutes, convert it to degrees, and then calculate the physical diameter given the angular diameter and the distance. Where was that in the background section? Here, using this, you know, our favorite angular ratio geometry that we've done four or five times now. Most significant source of errors, difficulty seeing where the edge actually is. I should also point out if in the picture the telescope pointing was off and your galaxy is like half off the image, uh, the instructions say measure from the center to the edge you can see and double it. Then the final questions, you know, how does the size of the Milky Way, which they measured in the previous section, compare to the sizes of these spiral nebulae? They all range from like 15 or 20 up to 50 or 60. And, and so the Milky Way is kind of in the middle of the group. And so the, you know, it's not many times larger, many times smaller than the spiral nebulae, which means the Milky Way is typical. And we're just one of countless many similar galaxies out there. Our galaxy is not special or the central object in the universe. And who is more correct about this? Curtis was. So that's that lab. Questions. I did with two minutes to spare, despite spending a lot of time talking about other things at the beginning. All right. If there are no questions, then put in your lab seven observations uh, and we'll do some radio astronomy next time. We'll weigh the whole damn galaxy. <laughs> all right. I'll talk to y'all later. Thank you. My pleasure. Dan, you got just one second? Yes. So following up on what I was asking, um, as far as uh, tools, I, you, see, you said Afterglow, um, and I've been told things like IRAF, and I know I've point, tinkered with IRAF and AstroImage J <laughs> and DS9. I'm trying to just understand right. the distinctions between them and overlap. Or Yeah, yeah I gave you definitions. I didn't give you tools. Um, right. So... Yeah, my bad there. So, no, that's okay. It's kind of outside the scope. So that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so for these lab activities, you know, we, we do have a set of tools. I mm -hmm. could not torment any student with IRAF, even grad students <laughs> in the modern day. Uh, I'm a bit of a say, I'm a, I'm a bit of a masochist. So. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, we, we built this such that survey level students <laughs> wouldn't have to install right. IRAF right. and all that. So for photometry, Afterglow is really good for this survey level. Yeah. And, and, the, and the quality of that comes out, it's professional algorithms. So you can actually do it right up through the research level. Okay. Now, spectroscopy, uh, that's different. If you're doing optical spectroscopy, we don't yet have tools for that uh, because we don't have any optical spectrographs on Skynet yet. But that's where you're generating a light curve for analysis, right? Uh, now, spectroscopy is where you're measuring... Here, I'll, I'll show you uh, radio spectrum. Okay. Well, I, I, yeah, I had I had an example up earlier, but it's still here. 
Yeah, so okay. here is a radio spectrum. In fact, I'll go to the live spectrum tool. I think we did this. Is this the one we did or similar to the one we did in the yeah. summer? Yeah. And so we can zoom in and measure spectral features. Also, in this environment, we have a, a tool that they'll use in Lab 7 that will take those data files and plot them in uh, centimeters instead of frequency. And it, it's a little bit easier to measure stuff in this tool. So uh, in the Opus Labs, we'll use this tool in particular, but it's really just for the H1 line. And so these are not... These tools, both this one and just using the, the Green Bank um, live spectrum tool, they're good enough for the student application for measuring mm -hmm. the wavelength of the line in its red shifted position, wherever it might be. Yeah, either this one or the other tool uh, that I just showed you that we'll be using next time. Okay. Now, if you want to do like something more advanced, like optical spectroscopy, then I'm sure there are different packages that the professionals uh, recommend for that. I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but mm. I, I can talk to some of my spectroscopy colleagues. And I imagine once we get some spectrographs on Skynet, we will be building student level tools so they can do measurements. But that, that's all trickier because the calibration process, both in wavelength and in flux of a spectrum is mm -hmm. trickier. But the right. spectrum is, you know, intensity versus frequency or intensity versus, in this case, wavelength. And uh, in the radio, you don't really have to calibrate it that that much. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I realize I'm in, in I'm all, I'm very much guilty of this. I'm trying to run before I, I crawl in, in some senses. So um, just a fatal flaw, I guess. But, um, but yeah. Yeah. And at least in the radio, you're going to get a lot of radio spectroscopy experience when you do Lab 7. And, and then if you do some of the MWU units, uh, we do it a lot there, too. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Good enough. Thank you. Sure. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Talk to you next week. Talk to you later.